after a day of talking with my agent and the art director, I was just like a kid in a sweet shop. I was like, is this really going to happen? It was to shoot in New Zealand. And it meant that I wasn't going to be, if I got the job, I wasn't going to be going to the big party we'd been planning for my wife's 50th. If you lead an interesting life, good pictures will happen. Oh, nice. You might well be my sexiest sounding guest. Go somewhere you've never been before and take a camera. We had this gorgeous Mediterranean light just flowing in. Which as do we win? A Dartford. Very nice. Your first 10,000 pictures are your worst. Let's sit down, let's have a cup of tea. Welcome to the show. Folks, thank you once again for joining me and welcome to another episode of the Standout Photography Show with me, Matthew Walker, where as always it is my honour and privilege to interview some of the finest working photographers in the world to unpack their systems, workflows and find out what enables them to perform consistently at the very top of their game. Today you are in for a real treat. My guest today is the wonderful Chris Fraser Smith. That is at C Fraser Smith on Instagram and Chris Fraser Smith.com on the webs. And that is Fraser with a Z. Chris is the Lucy International Photography Awards Photographer of the Year. Born in 1963 in the northwest of England, Chris grew up in East Anglia, picking up his first camera at a very early age, and he has been shooting ever since. Chris is a passionate people and portrait photographer whose work has taken him across the globe on behalf of a wide range of high-profile clients. His decorated career has seen him win some of the highest photography awards a photographer can receive, including the British Photography Awards Portrait Prize, the Association of Photographers Awards and International Photography Awards, to name but a few, many of which, I might add, he has won on more than one occasion. He has also proudly witnessed not one, but two of his images hanging in the prestigious National Portrait Gallery. Need I say more? Please enjoy my conversation with the delightful Chris Fraser Smith. Chris Fraser Smith, welcome to the show. Hello. How are you? Are you well? I'm very well. Nice nice to be here, Matthew. Yes. Uh, Yep, all fine. Uh, under these uh, strange times we're currently uh, going through. Good, good. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. One of the, I've spoken to a lot of photographers over the last few weeks, and one of the consistent, constant themes is home studios. And when we spoke yesterday, you mentioned you had a home studio, and I can now see you sat in your lovely home studio. So would you mind describing what that setup looks like? Uh, yeah, um, it, it's it's a purpose-built small building in our garden uh, that we built about uh, 10 years ago whilst I still had a studio in London in kind of as- anticipation that the transition was going to happen fully to get out of London I- into a studio space here. It's a, it's a, it's a studio in the sense that uh, I don't shoot in it. It's not big enough. It's about It's about four metres by six metres, but it's separate enough from the house to to leave the house uh, and feel like I'm going to my my place of work, although uh, work's probably not the right word to use all the time because it's an utter pleasure to be in here. And it's absolutely roasting <laughs> here today because I've closed all the doors and the windows to keep the noise down from fighting teenagers and uh, what have you, barking dogs and stuff. So, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic space and um, it's where I run the business from, do all my post-production on photography and film and while away perhaps far too many hours in here than I should do. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So you mentioned it's where you do all of your post-production. So what kit do you have in there that enables you to do that? Right, yeah. So if I'm doing post-production in-house, it's, it's predominantly on personal work. I tend to farm out um, commercial commission work to a couple of good companies in London, one in particular. And so I've got here, I'm talking to you on a on a 5K iMac. Uh, I've got another ISO, uh, a really old ISO actually, on my left as my, my second monitor. And I've got an array of uh, 12 hard drives down to my right. They're all hard drives. All my hero hard drives speak to a duplicate set in another part of the 
the house where all my equipment stored. Um, so I don't run a RAID system. I run a very basic, started off with one hard drive. Once that gets filled with raw files, get the second hard drive, so on and so forth. And then I've got working hard drives for just retouching scratch disk, for film editing, for backing up film edits, etc. So I try and keep it as simple as possible because obviously I'm, I tend to be managing it on my own here without any freelance assistance looking at this stuff now. Then run, then just running Photoshop, Capture One Pro. It's my, my workflow tends to be Capture One Pro into Photoshop uh, and that's it really. I don't touch Lightroom or Bridge and Final Cut Pro X for, for, for film editing. Fantastic. Well, we'll come on to your workflows and post-production a little bit later on. You mentioned just then that you'd taken the decision to move away from London in terms of your work. What prompted that decision? Because I guess it's one of those things. It's a dream for some photographers to work in those big London studios, you know, with the high-end equipment and all of those things. What prompted that decision to pull away from that? I think it was it was born out of the fact that, first of all, when our second child our daughter was born we were trying to get out of london anyway just because we we'd lived in london for the best part of 20 years and we moved out i had a i had a smaller studio then i had a a big studio in the center of islington for 14 years and there was one day where i turned to my then full-time assistant and said do you know we haven't shot in this studio for over 12 months because we were either shooting in higher studios or we were just traveling and shooting on location and the lease was coming up. So the short of it is it was it was time to move on and get out. So I actually bought a small building in North London. We had that for 10 years. Uh, and after four years, I kind of moved lock, stock and barrel into the room I'm sitting in now here, just because there was no need to commute into London on on days when we weren't doing pre-production or post-production. It seemed slightly pointless and a waste of time. So it was a natural trans transition that I think a lot of photographers have gone through with rents that that went up dramatically uh, in the late 90s and the noughties and also the the change of the way that photographers were being commissioned uh, and, a, and a lot of work uh, no longer really being shot in studios as much. Now I was doing my research before we came on here today and on your website it says that Chris Fraser-Smith is a portrait and people photographer. And then I read somewhere else that someone described you as taking photographs that explore the patterns of our existence in sophisticated urban environments, which I loved. But if you are somewhere at an event, perhaps, where someone isn't familiar with you, they're not familiar with your work, how do you describe yourself and your work? Yeah, I think I think like a lot of photographers, they, they, we we sometimes struggle to do to de- describe our specialism. And I had this yesterday shooting a portrait, and you know, I I tend to say I'm a people portrait photographer. And then to the uninitiated, you get that oh, so you, you know, you, what are you doing? Weddings? Are you doing corporate photography? What are you doing? And then you start to slowly trying to explain to them what it is you shoot um, and how you go about that a little bit. And at the end of the day, I just go, have a look at my website. That, that's the best way for you to understand what I shoot. But I, I try and shoot as uncomplicated portraiture as possible. And that ranges from what I re- refer to more as sort of environmental portraiture, where I'm, you know, for example, shooting a portrait of a steel fabricator on location or a butcher in his shop. So I like there to be a narrative in the picture that's more than just the person sitting for example in the picture when i say sitting i mean being present in the shot it's i think it's different when you're you're if you're just talking to an art buyer or uh, someone commissioning photography uh, editorially or at a record company because they would have already checked out your work and it's people and portraiture and then i'm really not worried what people think of that in their minds you know uh, and as i say a lot of the time they they do just think that uh, you're, you're photographing, you know, smiley families, families against um, mottled backgrounds or colorama, and that's how you make your living. Um, and, and I don't try and uh, get into a discussion too much about it with people because at the end of the day, they're never really going to understand what you do until they look at what you do. You touched on two interesting things there, which I'd like to journey back on. One of them is your website. You obviously have a huge portfolio behind you. How do you decide what work to showcase on your website? Because if you've got 20 years worth of work, how do you whittle that down to perhaps 100, maybe even 50 images 
to display your work? That's a good question, Matthew. I, and I think that you try and be brave, and it's that it's that cliched philosophy of, of less is more, and trying to leave people uh, wanting to see more. And at the beginning, I think with a lot of photographers, you have a new site, you 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 refresh part of the design, and you have this whole new mantra and philosophy. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to show. 50 pictures and and run with that but of course you sort of fall in love with the i mean you're all you know you're always falling in love but with probably the last shot you've just done hopefully and you've got i've got to show that i've got to show that so i have i have my my main portfolio on there which is all people all people doing something uh whether it's pure portraiture or whether it's commissioned photography where i've got people involved and then i have my individual little projects going on then i uh, have a commission section a film section so when it it starts out with a new site and 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 a refresh of course there tends to be less on there and i think all photography agents will sort of roll their eyes to the ceiling and they go oh god look at the way they put their portfolio together there's too much in here it's the wrong order etc etc so i don't know if i have an answer to it really i i i sort of did have this idea that in the portfolio i would have a maximum 50 images and that as soon as i start to feed more in i'd I'd edit images out which did start to happen and then of course you know you think oh actually i've got to keep on showing that it's a great picture people love it it gets a good reaction and do you know what i should uh, and maybe after this um, chat with you, I should really get onto it. And, and there should be a culling, quite frankly. Uh, you know, and it's a, it's the same with social media. You sort of spin back through your Instagram feed and you go, really, should I keep, should I, maybe I should just delete that now, you know. Because you want to throw out a message visually that very quickly, if you just look at the thumbnails of a photographer's work, when you look at at the at that, you, you should be able to very quickly, instantaneously go, okay, this is what they do. They shoot this. And I hope that when you look at the thumbnail section in any of my areas, that that, that comes across. And it's 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 unfiltered, untricksy, very little post-production portraiture, often a reenacted moments commissioned wise where you're seeing something that looks not like a snapshot, but looks like a very simple photograph that's been taken. But actually, of course, it's, all the elements are being controlled because it's commissioned and then it becomes more complicated. I've, I've, I still have print folios. So when I'm printing the print folios, they are in a way the, 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 the guidelines to what should be shown on my website because I'm putting, I am only putting 50 prints in my, uh, or 50 images in my, my print books. And actually when I look at them, I think this is what I should be doing on the website. It should reflect this. So watch this space. Maybe, maybe that, maybe that will happen during this uh, slightly strange time when we're re-evaluating so much of, of what we've done and we're revisiting perhaps a lot of photographers are revisiting uh, their archive um, and taking that trip down memory lane and, and seeing things that uh, re-inspire them reinvigorate them uh, and and remind them of perhaps you know they've lost their I'm not saying I've lost my way at all I have the opposite I think um, but maybe they need to sort of you know get back on track in, in some sort of visual space that really is what they specialize at doing one of the, uh, the the other thing I wanted to journey back on was one of the first things that struck me when I looked at your website, and it's that you have on there, and I think it's one of the first sections, you've got self-isolation portraits. Now, just some context for people listening, we're in week nine of the coronavirus UK lockdown. How long into lockdown did you start shooting those self-isolation portraits? I, about... Uh, the middle of week one, to be honest, I had started bizarrely. I got a, I got a huge uh, back catalogue of analog work, film, negatives, transparencies, and I just had my scanner serviced, and I'd got all of the work out, and I'd started to go through file after file, and I came across a shot, personal portrait I did of a friend called Andy. And he's standing in a glass stairwell in uh, which part of London is he in? I'm trying to think of the street. Anyway, and he is he's, he's inside the building. I'm outside the building and I'm looking up at him. And it sort of resonated with the knowledge that there was this, you know, we've been watching Italy in self-isolation, Spain in lockdown, um, China in lockdown. And all these images that were coming out of people with this physical barrier between them and the people seeing them. So when I saw that picture of Andy, I went, oh, right, okay, I should 
shoot some of these. So the first one I took was of my family standing at the, um, uh, at the doors of the back of the house and the garden uh, looking at me. And we have got, we've got four panes of glass there. So they've each got a pane of glass and one's empty, which a lot of people say, well, you should, you should be in that, Chris. And I go, well, I'm taking the picture. I can't be. I shot it and I stuck it on Instagram and, and immediately got really nice comments on Facebook as well. So I thought, oh, I should just do a series of these. And I feel that I can go out safely in, in the community I live in. I'm standing far, far more than two meters from people. They're, they're tending to be behind glass or some sort of physical barrier. That's changed a little bit now as the pressure has eased for us to, to, to stay behind glass and screens. And I've now shot, I think there's about 16 on the website. I've shot 24, shot one last night. I'm trying to shoot three or four a week. So yeah, after, after week one of proper lockdown, that's when it started. And I just very safely went around to friends initially who live in, in and around the village that we live in and did portraits of them. And it sort of started to snowball from there, really. So how have you found people to photograph in self-isolation? Is it friends, family? Is it your local village? How has that evolved? It's, it's, it's 99% the local village, partly born out of the respect of not traveling uh, un under the COVID so sort of lockdown. Although, of course, that's eased in the last 10 days as, as people are able to go and travel to, to places of leisure and return in the same day. So I can widen, widen it. But there's so many people in the village which were all being friends predominantly or people I know that I've started shooting. But it's now, it is now moving into an area where I'm getting people contacting me and saying, I've seen your pictures uh, on Facebook or Instagram. If you want to come and photograph me uh, and my family, then we'd love you to come and do it. So that's happened in the last couple of weeks now. So I am uh, doing a mixture of, of people I don't know in the community, people I recognise and have never spoken to in the community, and, and, and still some friends in the, in the community. So you said then that you'd started shooting them in week one of isolation. That's quick to put something into action. And I guess my question is, has that ability to adapt quickly and that want to create something that served you well in your professional career and if so are you able to give an example of where that willingness to act quickly has progressed your career i think i'm i'm told by art directors um sometimes that if we are for example the early days of location scouting and we're seeing pictures come in from a picture library and we shortlist some locations that we want to go and uh, do a tech scout and recce, that I've got this uh, bizarre ability to walk into a huge field or a building and just go and stand exactly where the camera should be and just go, right, this is, th it's here, this is the shot. So you take, some, you take some reference recce pictures and then the art director will go, what about over here? What about from here? What about from here? And you do all of that. And then 99% of the time, we always end, end up coming right back where I stood that first moment and go, this is where the shot has to be. So I'm sort of going a long way around talking about the, the self-isolating portraits, which are a, a re sort of return to my teenage years where I just had a camera and a passion to go out onto the streets and take photographs of people on the streets, try and stop people, uh, capture people working, you know, digging holes in the road, working on market stores. And you have very little time in those moments to nail the, the composition and then get the shot. So just going back out doing these self-isolating portraits, turning up to a, someone's house, having no idea what I'm walking into and how it's going to look, just going into their space and standing there and going, right, you, you're there, the shot's here, and doing it incredibly quickly, sometimes in and out within 15 minutes. The self-isolating thing is very much born out of just the need to take pictures all the time. I'm not very good at going for more than sort of four or five days without shooting something I really love. So I, I most of, if you, if you look at all my work, both in print and online, at least 80% of what you're seeing is non-commissioned. I show very little commissioned work these days, partly because in advertising where I'm predominantly known uh, and, and work, most art buyers, for example, know, know of me, know, know what I do. So I don't need to have a huge swathe of commissioned work to sort of have a proving ground that I'm capable to be trusted with a budget, with a job, and deliver the goods and more. 
And I find that over the years, actually, art directors, picture editors, even art buyers, they, they, they really want to see what you're up to with your personal photography and filmmaking. That, that's what interests them because they're looking to find something in that personal view uh, that you could perhaps bring to, to something they might want to commission. And the COVID thing's you know, part of that. It's just getting out and, thank goodness, I can go out and shoot portrait. And there's one other side to this, which is quite often photographers are reticent to photograph exactly what's on their doorstep uh, and in their community. It's often quite challenging to be inspired by right, everything that's immediately outside your front door. You feel that you've got to travel somewhere to become, you know, inspired to, to take a picture. I'm not saying fly out of the country, but everything seems more exotic when you're slightly out of your own community and therefore it's, you, you respond to it in a different way. So to be photographing friends in the, in the village, acquaintances in the village and people I don't really know in the village it has, it's just, I find it so exciting. And I'm so, I haven't, I mean, I'm, you know, I like the pictures. I haven't shot one dud yet, in my opinion. I'm sure uh, that's not the case with people viewing them. They'll like some and they won't like others. That's just normal. But it, it's just thrilling. Uh, and I, I almost approach, I, when I'm photographing friends in the village over the last eight or nine weeks, it's, I've, I've taken on a very different viewpoint of how I'm seeing them in their space. Uh, I'm seeing them in a much more with a sort of more documentary eye, I think, because I'm still trying to get a narrative into these pictures, what, where they're standing, what they're standing in, if they're standing in their, their very badly grown vegetable patch, whether they're holding a, one of their pets, whether they're holding something in their hands that reflects what they might have been up to during the day because they're in lockdown. All those little subtle clues in the pictures that to me are really important. And it's, it's sort of the devil in the detail, I think, in those shots. It's funny you should say that it takes lockdown to realise what is right under your nose because I, for example, my daily routine for a long while has been going out with the dog and every time I've been out with him, I take my camera, which is something I never normally do around the house because, as you said, sometimes you think, oh, you've got to go somewhere exotic or somewhere far away to shoot something great and actually there's some wonderful things right under your nose if you're looking for them. Where did your journey start as a photographer? What was, what did your... I mean, you sent me a photo the other day with, I think you were three years old and had a camera in your hand, so it was clearly uh, something you were very interested in from a young age. But what was your training like as a photographer? It's, that's, I th I'll try and answer that for you. Um, so that picture of me as a three-year-old is just a happy picture that uh, I think a grandparent had, had shoved this. Uh, it's not a box brownie because uh, I'm not that old, but it, it's, some, you know, it's an old Bakelite Kodak camera. But there was a very strong draw. I, I, I wasn't, I didn't enjoy school. I didn't enjoy being, uh, learning the traditional subjects at school. And I, I went, I was at school that kind of had no, nothing really positive to promote in terms of if you had a, a visual bent that they would encourage you to go down that route, encourage you perhaps to consider going to art college. And from a very young age, I, I actually asked for my first camera when I was seven. I'm told, and I was uh, I was bought a, a Kodak Instamatic cassette, 35 mil cassette camera, and as a so the first sort of accolade I got is that was a as a Cub Scout. The only badge I got as a Cub Scout was the photography badge, and I took pictures of cows in a field somewhere in Cambridgeshire, and I was chuffed to bits. I didn't get any other badges. I, I don't think I I think I failed whatever other badges we were trying to get. So. I think from a, my grandfather, my, my um, maternal grandfather was a really keen amateur. And he, when he retired, he used to go around the country talking to predominantly sort of national trust people uh, and showing them uh, slides perhaps on a, you know, on a house or something to do with the national trust. And he'd taken all the photographs. And I grew up with him being fascinated by projecting these images on, on, a, on a screen in his house. And without realizing, it, I guess, sort of fell in love with the way that you could communicate in a language that was as important as any other language through a visual medium. So it, it, it grew from there. And then I think that the lucky thing, my parents had were, were very distracted, as parents can often be with their own marriage. When they got divorced, I was 16. And it was actually, I realized immediately 
I could now go down a path that I wanted to because I'd researched the fact that when I left school, I could go and do a thing called Art Foundation. I could go to what was then a polytechnic and go to art college and study photography. And that's that's in a nutshell. That's what I did. I turned my my bedroom into a dark room age 16. I blacked out all the windows with double sided tape and black bin liners. There was no water in there. So I used to I, I had my enlarger set up in there. I then put the, the exposed paper in a box take it into the bar, the bathroom where I had done the same with the windows uh, and, and ran the wet bench in there, age 16. And I just learned, I just taught myself all of that, really, with, with the helpful John Hedgeco in his books, I seem to remember, which I'm sure hopefully a lot of your listeners will have dusty old John Hedgeco books on their shelves. So that journey took off. And then I, I got into Essex School of Art on my own in the sense that I went to the Careers Advice Centre in the local town I grew up in, which was very nice middle-class Cambridge, and realized, okay, I can. They were, they were really helpful. You can do an art foundation course, then if you do well on that, you can go to art college and you can study painting or sculpture or ceramics or three-dimensional design, etc. Uh, the day before my interview at Essex School of Art, I told my mum, I've got an interview tomorrow at Essex School of Art, can you take me? And she was completely flabbergasted. And she said, you know, anyway, I explained the whole thing, I had produced a set of black and white prints that I'd mounted on cardboard, which I was quite proud of. I went and had the interview and I got in. So I went to Essex School of Art. Then the journey went to Wolverhampton Poly, where I studied graphic design. But with the graphic design course there after year one, uh, you specialised in printmaking, photography, graphics, uh, typography. And the, the photography set up at Wolverhampton still today is absolutely fantastic. A superb driving ground floor studios, big wet process dark rooms, proper big rooms for editing post production wise on Max. I only know this because I, I went back for the first time after 29 years, two years ago, and to to see it still in its, uh, you know, still intact as as many art colleges aren't anymore, was fantastic. So then that was the route to graduating with a graphics degree, but specialising in photography. And then it was like so many to London to assist to down the yellow brick road. And I assist, I did a bit of freelance assisting between graduating and uh, December of the same year. And then I got a full time job with a photographer called Gerard Mankovic. And I was his first assistant for f just over three years. Uh, and he, Gerard was then shooting people, predominantly all studio based doing some location editorial work, but with a with a sort of studio head on in terms of always lighting those shots rather than using natural light. And the years with Gerard were just fantastic. We had a, an amazing three years working, to, well, with me working for him, absolutely flat out nonstop. I'd use his studio uh, to do all my own personal work in. He's still a very good friend today uh, and, and, and is sconced down in Cornwall now with his fantastic archive of, of rock and celebrity photography. And then it was then it was the jump out into the big wide world of, you know, OK, I've got to go and do it myself now. And that was in 1991. Crikey, I've given a lot away now, haven't I? I love the the um, I, like I've spoken to so many photographers and their journeys of going to London and and working with photographers and learning on the job. How did you get those jobs as an assistant in the early days? Did you? write to people did you send portfolios did you literally go around knocking on doors how did you end up with those wonderful photographers yeah well it's difficult to imagine now because of course and that's a good question because it, it was there was no email there was no you know there wasn't a, a it was nothing digital so the pace of how things happened was just the pace that you you accepted as being normal i wrote to uh, a handful of photographers i think all of them replied they all replied with you know beautifully typed letters um, which I've still got uh, stored away in a filing cabinet next to me. You know, I saw people like Patrick Litchfield in his studio in Labrook Grove. I went to see uh, Terry Donovan at his studio on uh, in New Bond Street and, and others. And Gerard was on that list. And I, and I was just of the school of thought that, you know, I like what these photographers do naively. If I, if I, I you know, because it was the first time you come up against their personalities. And they were all lovely, to be honest. I mean, Terry Donovan was extraordinarily generously generous with his time he talked to me for about three hours in his beautiful office and and was showing me videos that he'd been directing you know and then i got some freelance work out of a few of them and then uh, gerard said well, come into a day day with me as first assistant and see how you cope and he did a portrait on location for uh, the observer magazine 
and offered me the job uh, on the spot. So yeah, it was. It, it, that's how it was done then. It's, I think it's much, in a way, the communication seems easier now because you can. E I, I mean, I think everyone relies on email too much. And when I do any session lecturing, I say to students, the big difference is this thing called a phone. You've all got them, and the irony is you never make any phone calls on them. Use it to make phone calls. Ring these people up. It makes an enormous difference, you know. And I, I think that. The, it's so much more competitive out there in terms of getting any assisting work. Having a full-time assistant is a, is a much rarer thing now as well. And, you, you know, also in the digital world, I have two very long-term freelance assistants I've used for over 25 years. I'm just very lucky. And both Neil and Paul are utter geniuses when it comes to assisting. They are brilliant anticipators. They We, we communicate without talking in terms of you know, gauging a situation. So when you find a couple of uh, good freelance assistants now or a good digiop, uh, you, you tend to try and use them all the time if they're available. So I, I, I do think that it is challenging now for young, younger up-and-coming ex-college leavers or boys and girls that just have a passion for photography and try and go out and assist. You, you've just You've just got to persevere and gauge, you know, whether you're being a pain or, or not by keep badgering people that you want to go and work for. It, it's uh, I don't have an easy answer for that for the next generation. And they, they might be able to tell me. <laughs> Has your degree in graphic design helped you as a photographer, particularly on larger jobs or even smaller jobs for that matter, to be able to picture the end product where it will sit in a magazine, for example, or on a poster and where the typography will be. Has that knowledge helped you in your career as a photographer? I think that I think because I did a lot of graphic design and then I went and worked with a photographer where everything is being shot on Polaroid, first of all, you know, and we're using acetates, drawing on acetates to work out where the main headlines of a 48 sheet post might be or where the copy is going to sit on an ad. It was all very much worked out by the art director in terms of a definitive, well, this is exactly where the copy will be. Whereas now often that moves around a little bit. You give everybody a little bit more space. So, you you know, you knew where the gutter had to be on a picture. So when the magazine was folded, you weren't losing, you know, a, a very important part of the picture. So I think those assisting years, you learn more. And then when it's you know, just going through the process now into uh, to digital, where we just throw up overlays on Capture One, and we can just see how the artwork's going to fit on a on any capture. I guess with hindsight, yes, it did help. Um, I definitely have a, a, a big passion for for design and and typography in particular. I'm a terrible designer, I hasten to add. So I really love good design, and you, you know, especially when it's advertising, because. I think since the early 90s, when the clients got more of a hold of everything, you know, how budgets worked, how uh, the creative process would pan out um, for what they wanted, I, I think, you know, it's, it, it's rarer to see some stunningly beautiful looking ads these days. And clients need to be aware of that. And, and they need to remember that they're paying a creative director, an art director, a designer to do something because they're much better at than than they are as the client, and uh, uh, that that's an important lesson I think for a lot of clients is to give the people they employ uh, and and pay money to, to to allow them to do their job. What was your first big job when you were out into the big wide world? And I guess it it doesn't maybe even have to be one particular job. It could be a series of jobs which shifted you towards larger clients and larger projects yeah i pretty much know what that is uh, i'd like so many photographers when you're starting out you know it's quite hard work you know you're you're working every day either with your with the phone and making appointments to traipse around the streets to to go and see people with your portfolios and you pick up a little bit of work and you're all you know the first sort of couple of years was really hard work financially I had a, a very small office that I rented in what's now called Eagle Wharf Studios, uh, which I'm sure you know. At the time, funnily enough, it was it was named Holborn Studios after the original Holborn Studios location. So when Holborn Studios 1 shut down, they kept the name for the new setup that is now known as Eagle Wharf Studios. And I think it, it was probably after about 12 months, they thought, 
there's still a lot of people going to deliver things to the wrong address. We need to change the name. So they changed the name to Eagle Wolf Studios. And I can remember, I don't know how it happened, but I suddenly got a phone call from a French agent who'd seen something. And I can't remember what they'd seen. And she said, do you have a rep, uh, an agent in, 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 in Paris? And I said, uh, nope. And she said, well, you know, can you send me a portfolio? So I sent her a portfolio and she started repping me. And very quickly, I got my first job in Paris, uh, from, sorry, from Paris to shoot in England uh, for a Scottish whiskey company called Glenord Whiskey. And I met this young French team and we got on like we'd kn- we just got on like we'd known each other all our lives, this copywriter and this art director. And they've become very good friends of mine and remain so to this day. My French was very sketchy. Thank God their English was good. So I shot this job for Glenord Whiskey, which was portraiture. We cast people at the distillery to reenact something, black and white, all shot on uh, my RZ Mamiya's at the time, which are beautiful cameras and still have them to this day. And that campaign really stood out in France. It won awards for them. And then I got another job for them, another black and white job for a French bed mattress company. And it was a really extraordinary campaign because it it, it almost had nothing in it visually to do with mattresses whatsoever. Uh, Again, that that won awards for them. It won them Lions at Cannes. So it kind of snowballed from there. And there was a period when I was on Eurostar going back and forth to France for the best part of six years, I guess. And at that time, for probably four of those years, I only ever showed black and white work. And I only showed black and white work as original prints out of my darkroom that I would print that were all 20 by 24 uh, inch prints. Huge book. I've got one I can see hidden down here. And I've actually, behind me here is still some of the Kodak paper I used to print on. I used to only print on a paper called Ectolure, which they don't make anymore, unfortunately. And it says it has no um, grading on it. So you really had to work hard in the darkroom to get the tonality right. So it, it was it was a, a mixture of, when I say luck, I always think with luck, you put yourself in a place to be noticed and you get lucky because you put yourself there. But it was really, it was really working with that team uh, on the Glen Ord pictures that... Um, that meant that with Jean-Philippe, who's the copywriter, and and Fred, who's the art director, he's now a very highly thought of creative director at Publicis in Paris. And they, you know, uh, Jean-Philippe is no longer a copywriter. He got out of advertising. But yeah, it was it was that that step into black and white photography that you'd never really know now looking at my work because it's predominantly all color. There's one little, you know, when you go to my website and you hit uh, you go to the home page and the images on my homepage, roll over and mostly change all the time. I've got one of the shots that I did for Fred and Jean-Philippe on there still as a sort of tribute to them because I owe, I feel I owe them as much as... I, I owe them a lot of gratitude for, for giving me commissioned work that I had none of it in my portfolio. I think they'd seen something in colour and they said, well, if you can do it in colour, you can do it in black and white. It's easier, you know which is not necessarily true. That was a period when the curvature of success started to go up and I could start to invest more of the income I was earning into equipment and building into my own studio space eventually, Mm -hmm. uh, having a proper dark room and having a full-time PA, et cetera, full-time assistant, yeah. So I owe it all to the French, Matthew. That is a wonderful, wonderful answer. And if anyone wants to go and check that shot out, I'll put a link in the show notes to your website, which is chrisfrasersmith.com, if I'm not mistaken. And the shot in question is a it's a naked girl strung out and her head's resting on a chair and her, at the back of her ankles are resting on a chair. But she's completely uh, horizontal across the shot. You've obviously done an awful lot of work since then to name a few you have done work for uk census 2021 which is obviously yet to be released i'm assuming uh Saatchi and Saatchi, new york cadbury's hsbc samsung volvo the list just goes on and on where does your work come from now at this place in your career is it from your website do you have an agent is it word of mouth is it contacts that you've worked with previously or is it ultimately a combination of all of those things? 
Uh, it's, uh, it's exactly the, the last one. It is a combination of all of those things. And I don't, I have no representation anymore, partly out of design uh, and partly out of not really the need to have representation in terms of still making a living and paying the bills. I'm very fortunate in the, in the sense that when I've parted company with, with the, the agents that I've had over the years, we've parted always on amicable terms and um, my last English agents, um, I, I speak to them uh, or one of them occasionally and we're, we're still uh, friends and uh, it's the same with my, my New York agents, uh, my last American agents who decided, I, whether it was out of Make America Great Again, I don't know. But they decided to uh, to ditch all their non-American photographers in the same week. If an agent becomes a friend and then we part company, you know, I'm hoping that there is a, a division between business and, uh, and friendship. And I don't go, right, you're not my friend anymore, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, you know, it's a thing of having made some great friends through the business over the years. But to go back to your original question, yes, it's a combination of, uh, people discover me for the first time through social media, art buyers who know what I do, picture editors who know what I do, coming across someone who goes, oh, you shoot that? Okay, well, uh, we might have something for you, you know. I'm very happy marketing myself. I don't like marketing myself. It's hard work. And agents do a really, really good job at it, I think. So, you know, I've had a couple of people knock on the door in the last 12 months and say, Chris, are you, you know, what do you think? Would you like to come and be rep by us? And do you know what? I haven't, I haven't been rude or anything, but I just said, actually, no, I, I, I'm quite happy at the moment where I am. Also, partly because they, they weren't quite right for me, because I've got, you know, I have got quite a lot of experience now. So if the right person comes along, I've had it from America twice this year already, funnily enough, in this COVID times. But getting, getting the right visas in place for the USA now is a nightmare. And I know a lot of photographers will, will fly to the States, shoot and work, repped in America, they won't have the right visas. But if they if they get caught on the border, they're pretty much never going to be allowed back in the country again. So I'd rather play it, you know, by the letter of the law than to try and do it, you know, under the radar. So if the, anyway, if, if the right person comes along in Europe and says, look, you know, we'd love to rep you, then I'm, I'm almost certainly going to go, yeah, great, you know, let's do it. Well, I hadn't realised it was that strict to work in the US as a, a UK worker yeah if you're being paid by the american authority if you're being paid by the by the, the american dollar in the usa you need to make sure you have all the right paperwork in place uh, and i've always had what's called an o1 visa which is uh, gives me the right to live in america for an x amount of time an american social security number still and the the visas used to be four years then during obama's second term they dropped three years and now under the present I think there's someone running in America now. I can't quite work it out. Um, but um, there, it's really hard work now getting a getting an O-1 visa. You can get other visas, but they don't give you the same uh, entitlement as, as an O-1 visa. I guess this kind of leads me on rather nicely to my next question, actually, which was, have you ever found yourself in a situation on a shoot where circumstances outside of your control could affect the outcome of your work and if so how have you problem solved and managed that situation to ensure that your work still remains strong and you deliver the final product that you're happy with yes uh yeah and it's called the weather it's always been it's always <laughs> been the weather um i've i've had a few stroppy models over the years but i'm i'm pretty i'm pretty good at managing people i'm i'm not i don't i'm not aggressive i don't throw my toys out of the pram i'm not you know when you're commissioned it's a, it is a team uh, you know and you're the photographer and it's your say at the end of the day but you're very much reliant on everybody within that team no matter how big or small it might be from your creative director to your digi op to your hair and makeup i mean you you know yourself from commercial shoots how that operates and in my humble opinion everyone on that shoot really is we're all on the same level. You know, everyone is as important as each other. Take one of those people out of the equation and you're in real trouble, you know. But I've been in, I've had a one weather thing, for example. I was shooting in America and we were shooting on a golf course in Florida. And we had a tech scout day to go and work out what greens we were going to shoot on, which bunkers we need to shoot on. And I was, I seemed to be the only one that had looked at the weather forecast. And the, the, the tech scout day, we had complete access to the course. 
I always text out with the cameras I'm shooting on uh, and reenact it for real. And I said to everyone, have you the weather forecast tomorrow? There is no dry m minute in the day. It's going to be a tropical storm. And there were, oh, my God, well, so what are we going to do? I said, well, we, sh we have to shoot it on the tech recce day, you know. So we shoot beautiful day, go around dawn till dusk, mainly shooting at dawn, mainly shooting at dusk, get everything in the can. Next day, absolute deluge. So that that worked out. Another one I remember was uh, wasn't the weather; it was the um, the water department in Barcelona. Uh, I was shooting for Coca Cola in Barcelona, and uh, on the back of TVC, which means television commercial. So. Uh, I was shooting the print and the press for the for this campaign while they were shooting the television uh, work, and we get we had a, a tech scout day, and the forecast was stunning. The the shoot day was the next day. The forecast was stunning, and I just thought, well, I don't know why I did it. I just thought, well, let's go and shoot. Let's just shoot film anyway. Let's just shoot this all as background plates. All the pictures I was going to shoot were of uh, a boy or a girl either individually or together, drinking out of a Coke bottle, backlit by the sun or a little bit of artificial light that we'd introduce, but always with some of the fantastic uh, fountains in full flow that Barcelona has. So those were the locations. And I just thought, they're so beautiful anyway. Let's just let's get my assistant to stand in, step out, and I'll shoot the backgrounds with the right camera focus. So there's a degree of slightly softness going on in the background. Shot them all. The next day, none of the fountains are on. They've all been swatched, switched off for maintenance uh, on a Sunday for you know the 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 the, the, the Barcelona waterworks to go in and, and sort of um, service everything. We couldn't get them switched back on. TV, the TV shoot got shut down for the day, and I just sort of um, with a big smile on my face went, "Hey, no, we're fine. We'll just go back. We'll shoot the talent in the same locations, and we'll just cut them out and strip them in." And that's what we did. And uh, it, it worked because they didn't have any permits for stills for the following day to shoot. So that was a bit of luck. I mean, you say it's luck, but it's it's what I was trying to focus on earlier, particularly with the golf course. It's that ability to think quick and act quick, which is most important because you could have waited and just hoped that the following day was fine. Mm. Instead, you chose it's a bit like it's the self-portrait thing I was talking about earlier. You chose to act which I think is fascinating because without that ability to act quickly, you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't get those shots and you wouldn't deliver yeah. the final product for the client. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's just how I am, I guess, Matthew. I, 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 I'm pretty organized, um, but, but not in the military style. I, I'm, I just suppose I'm a natural worrier, I think. So I tend to research a lot of things prior to going into them, whether it's, you know whether we're going into a uh, onto a bit of unmade road we're shooting in, shooting outdoors a lot. You're obsessed about the weather, and you're you're obsessed about where the sun will be at any one time during daylight hours. So I'm a sort of natural worrier. So I suppose I'm uh, I'm not a nerve. I'm not nervous. I'm just checking out stuff in advance, partly out of curiosity because you always discover and learn new things. Uh, talking to local people is always a, a brilliant thing to do. Uh, not just your local location manager or producer or, uh, you know, local talent. You try and talk to the, the bloke behind the bar in the evening. You find out all sorts of things. And I think it's, I think it's just more desirable. I always want to take pictures. You know, if, if someone rings me up and says, uh, we've got virtually no budget for this, Chris. Um, you know, this is the idea. Here are the layouts or this is the concept. Would you be interested? If I know that the, 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 the payoff is getting great pictures, then I'm, I'm going to do it. I think providing you're, you're getting your production costs covered, then you're going to want to shoot the pictures. But most photographers want to take pictures. Uh, good photography agents want to earn a lot of money for them and their photographers. So that combination works really well. But at the end of the day, I, I just want to get out and take pictures. So whether that plays into a little bit of the you know, problem solving or, or doing things and then the unexpected happens and you go, well, actually, we're OK because I did this yesterday or I did this in the last hour. I don't know, really. Now, um, now something will go horribly wrong. <laughs> <I've said all laughs> and you go, I spoke to that guy. Ever since I spoke to him, um, you've teed me up beautifully for this next question, which I was going to say, there's 
often a lot of pressure on shoots, or certainly can be, particularly on, on larger shoots where there's a lot at stake, whether that's money, deadlines to meet, or the million and one people that want to be pleased. Do you personally ever feel that pressure? And if so, what techniques have you developed over the years to deal with it? You said you were a natural warrior, which is what I felt teed me up perfectly. So what have you developed over the years to deal with that? If at all, I, you might not feel that pressure. Well, I think, yeah, I think in my 20s on, on advertising shoots, I would be often awake all night thinking about this, thinking, did we triple check the kit? Have we got the two Polaroid backs in, the, in, the, in that bag or that box? You know, you know I, I, I would over, overly think things, I think, in, the, in my 20s. By the time I sort of go into my 30s and I've got more experience, and I, I, now I, I don't worry at all. I really don't worry at all. I think... That's partly because you're, you've got a wealth of experience. I know that the, the freelance people that I work with on, on my shoots are, are there to do the best possible job they can, and then they're, they're, they're going to focus and be on it. So I don't have to worry about them. A shoot will only go as smoothly and as successfully as all the planning you put into it. So providing everything's in place uh, and the weather forecast is what you want it to be, whether it's good weather or you want bad weather, then you really enjoy the shoot, actually, uh, and that's that's been the case for many many years for me. I don't uh, I don't worry anymore because I've I, I, you also learn actually if you do if you are worrying uh, inevitably things always turn out for the best anyway. There's no point in worrying. They worry when something suddenly goes wrong uh, or if it does go wrong. Worry about okay, how do we solve that now and safely? You, you know, I think I get told nice things from sort of art buyers about the ease that it is to work with me and i'm not saying that just to big myself up you know it's very rare that you, you as photographers you get pats on the back awards is one sort of pat on the back to some degree but y yeah i don't i don't really worry anymore to be honest matthew well awards which you mentioned then we'll come on to a little bit later on but you also mentioned that you have two assistants now that you work with on a regular basis and if you're on a shoot with both of those assistants what jobs will you delegate to them and perhaps I guess more importantly what jobs will you never delegate to them well both of them are are very good digital operators um, both of them are very good knowing how I want to light things and taking lighting direction from me if we're if we're lighting with flash or we're lighting with HMIs or or, or other incandescent lights and Funnily enough, what I try and do with them is to mix it up. So if we are shooting next week, I will get one of them to be the digiop and the other to not be the digiop. And then if in three weeks' time we're back together again, I will swap it around. So can, can I just uh, stop you one second? For anyone that doesn't know what a digiop is, can you just explain that for us? Yes, it's the, the digital operator. It's the person sat behind your, your Mac or your, 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 your laptop who is watching the shots come into the computer and making sure that that they are as they should be that what it should be in focus is in focus nothing weird has happened the camera hasn't moved they're backing up the files onto to at least two external hard drives at various points during the shoot so they're they're really your they're they're sort of they're they're like a technician would be in a dark room in the old days um, they're kind of that that in the digital world there's not much I wouldn't de uh, delegate with. They're both so experienced. They're both brilliant with clients, with talent. You know, they know when to talk, not when to talk, as, as we all do, hopefully, on shoots. They, they're really good at spotting things. If I, if, if, you know, obviously with digital, if I'm using a very shallow depth of field, I, it's really important they're not distracted. The digital operator is not distracted by checking what is sharp is going to be sharp, which is usually often just, you know, from the, from the eye, eyes to the nose things like that. What wouldn't I give them to do? It's difficult. I, I pretty much trust them with everything, to be honest, you know, in terms of setting things up, pre-lighting, checking equipment lists, looking at stuff we're hiring in, uh, advising me if you, I know, I will, will, I'll always run my hire list past both of them and, and say, look, what do you think is missing from this? You know, I feel like kind of we're getting everything in. Do you think, and usually nine times out of ten, they'll go, well, just why don't you get two more of those or get one of those, but get it a smaller size or something, whatever it might be. They're very, uh, they're very experienced and, and very professional. Um, uh, and, you know, when I don't have them on shoots, which does happen, and I've got some new blood on a shoot, it's usually through a recommendation from them. And, you know, I trust them implicitly on their recommendations. And 
and touch wood uh, that's never you know never been a problem I guess I could have maybe phrased that slightly differently when I said are there things that you would never delegate I don't mean in necessarily in terms of trusting them with something but are there certain elements that you you like to do yourself because that's how you've always done them yeah, I like to light everything myself. I know there are photographers who bring in lighting, uh, you know, so-called lighting specialists from, from assistants. Uh, but I, lo- I love to light everything. And, I, you know, uh, photography is all about light. So, you know, as a kid growing up, in, in age 16, with my black, plastic blacked-out windows that I was, you know, had a little semi-dry darkroom in, I was buying uh, daylight bulbs and screwing them into angle poise lights and then putting tracing paper underneath them and starting to learn what that does. Um, so, you know, as an assistant, all you're doing is lighting predominantly if you're working with a studio photographer. So I'm very hands-on with lighting. So I, I don't like them to do my lighting. At the same time, there's often situations where you need to be behind the camera. So you're, you're just directing the lighting. You know, they're putting up, you know, an, a, a 2400 pro photo head on the left with an octa at this angle on a boom or whatever and you're 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 doing that and i will always go and stand where the talent's going to stand and i will look at my lighting around me just to make sure that even the tiniest bit of angle needs adjusting i will get it adjusted so i like to oversee my lighting i don't like to have assistants come in and go right tell me about your lighting and i'll set it up for you i'll say well look um i'll tell you about my lighting but we'll set it up yeah that's one yeah uh yeah, I can't think of any others really, Matthew. To That's be honest, okay. That's okay. They, they will, they will be there. It'll pop into my head. I'm going to worry about it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're when you're travelling for work abroad, in particular, what does your kit look like? Now, I know this will vary depending on on the job, but what I'm getting at essentially is what what does your kit look like on a shoot abroad versus something that perhaps is more local or in london for example because i'm guessing you have to be more streamlined if you're carting everything across to the states yeah absolutely so you you the, my my philosophy is i'm sure with many photographers you just try and rent as much kit as you can locally um which is easy in some territories uh, and much more difficult in other territories Digital and certain lighting now has mean it means that you you can travel with a with quite a lot of you can be armed with quite a lot of lighting at, at quite a low uh, weight impact you know with good um, for example you know the the B1X kits from Profoto for example they're pretty good but there's there's only so much those lights will do so you you, you try and work as much you can everywhere with with local equipment and if anything goes wrong with it you then got that company you're hiring from to make sure that it's fixed and uh they've got backup so nine times out of the ten when i'm when i'm traveling i'm traveling with two equipment wise i'm traveling with two roller low pro roller bags uh that are nine times out of ten have got my phase kits in i've got duplicate phase camera kits and two macbook pros and usually an array of four external hard drives I like, I've always had this thing about, you know, anything mechanical will eventually fail. So I always have two shoot max. We only ever use one. And if one of those goes down uh, or suddenly the, the mains power lead to it is frayed and you haven't noticed and you've got no power going to a Mac, you've got a backup. So that's, that's pretty much it now, flying uh, or traveling into Europe via car or van. It's usually, you know, with very little equipment actually i i might take um a small box of clips gaffer tape uh laster light reflectors i often will travel with two tripods i've got a very late lightweight uh gits tripod with a geared head and i've got the full old big school heavy job big head on it i don't like to travel as with with a lot of e- equipment if i can help it and it's certainly very different now in the digital age traveling uh, versus the analog years traveling uh, when I would be traveling with 10, 8, 5, 4 plate cameras, uh, uh, 50 dark slides. I'm, I would try and buy film and Polaroid locally, but occasionally we would run the gauntlet with, um, with X-ray and take it through X-ray. But, you know, that's not, that's not the case anymore. Yeah, I think it's funny. You can hire kit. It's surprising that you can find kit in the strangest of places. And then you have the opposite. You can go to big cities. Like, for example, 
I've shot in Beijing a couple of times. We've gone in as tourists, always from Hong Kong with a tourist visa, just with a laptop, and that's it. And we've hired, I've hired Hasselblads and phase cameras in Beijing. And whoever you hire them off, they are they are like a limpet. They follow you around because they're slightly worried that you're going to run off with it, you know. Um, <laughs> and the same with lighting. I've hired it in China. Um, it's just. It's just the way they work. You'd, you'd think that somewhere like Beijing, you could find a huge amount of photographic equipment to rent. It's actually not the case. You go to somewhere like Tunisia, and actually you can find a lot more, bizarrely, whether they own it or not, or whether they've stolen it from the previous photographer they worked for, I don't know. But I don't want to cast dispersions. So you have to be very careful. I've been, we've, been, we've been robbed once on a golf, another golf course in the south of uh, Spain, uh, where we were obviously being observed from the hotel. They followed us to the location. Uh, we had private car parking at the golf course. We shot all day on the golf course. We came back and all our personal effects had been stolen. No equipment because we had it with us, but all our personal effects had been stolen. Everything gone. No passports, funnily enough. We all had our passports on us. So that was a strange one. And then over the course of about three hours, we started getting phone calls um, from people, from very nice local Spanish people who'd seen a man drop a suitcase off by the side of the road and drive off. So they curiously went over to see what was in there, found people's clothes and toothbrushes and what have you, and then looked at the name tag and rang the number on the name tag. And we, we, we managed to get about half of it back on that day. But hey-ho, that was, that was just a, a one, you know, just one of those things. You, you touched on earlier at the very start of, our conversation actually your your workflows so when you from the moment you you finish to shoot and you take the cards out of the camera what does that journey look like for you from the moment the card comes out of the camera to the day that you deliver the images and you sign off on the job uh, as soon as the cards out of the camera if i'm not shooting tethered so for example the self-isolating portraits they're just card so uh, as soon as i get the cards back to the studio here they get backed up onto the current hard drive. They then get Chronos using some software called Chronosync. They get synchronized over to drives in another part of the, the house. And then I will, only then, when I check Chronosync's got it absolutely right, and it's never, ever, ever, ever not got it right. It's amazing software. I then start to go through the, the shots in, in Capture One Pro, and I've used Capture One Pro for probably I, well, at least 12 years, funnily enough and just did an upgrade today to 20.1 or whatever it is today. And I, I often will go to the last shot and work backwards. I will often have something in my head, I go, it was about a third of the way through that they did something and I've really got to look at that and I'll quickly find it. And then I'll start just star marking between one and five. If it's five, it's got a very, it gets down, to, you know, it's gonna go into the final mix. And then I'll look at all the fives and I'll start to color code them in the same way as traffic lights flow. So they all get a red mark if they're gonna go down to the wire. Then I'll look at all the red marked ones and I'll get those down to two or three. They get amber and then I'll walk away from it. And I try and walk away from it for at least a day. And I'll come back and I'll look at the ambers and I'll go, actually, I'm gonna go back to the reds now and have a look at the reds again. And then I go, actually, I'm gonna look at the five stars again. And you'll find things and you then start distilling it down again. Uh, and then I find, I'll find one and I'll, I'll, I'll give it a, 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 green, a green rating and that's the one I'll work up. Um, so then that gets worked up into Photoshop. I like to do very little in Photoshop. I'll do always a little bit in Capture One Pro. I'll just uh, put a bit of clarity and structure into the shot on the slider. I might increase a little bit the brightness by a tad because I'll often work to the histogram on the back of a, 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 of a Canon, for example, and trust the histogram more than the playback on the screen, which means I often get slightly underexposed pictures, but I prefer that to open it up a little bit. Go into Photoshop, have a look at it. I never apply any sharpening uh, off uh, my phase or my, my Canons. I don't know why, uh, so there's no sharpening. I might look at the colors a little bit and just gently pull the colors around a tiny bit. 
But then I always run everything and have run any, everything through a plugin called it's the Nix collection. And I use Color Effects Pro and I use Color Effects Pro and I, I play with their contrast plugin and then I play with their dark and light and center. I always put ever such really subtle vignette on my shots and I ever so slightly brighten it in the middle because or I brighten it where I want the eye to go. And it's, it's born out of spending years in a dark room, dodging and burning and going, right, I'm going to hold back and I'm just going to dodge the area I want ever so slightly to lift because I want that person's eye to be drawn to the shot. Um, and the other thing I, I would say, which I should have said at the beginning, is I never crop my pictures, personal pictures. I shoot everything full frame. I've always shot full frame. I never consider cropping into a negative or a transparency back in the day. And I don't like the idea of cropping into digital either. It's just, that's what I like to do. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why that is. It's probably years of shooting analog film where you're analyzing Polaroids and you're, 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 you're just looking at everything on the Polaroid. And if you need to crop the shot, you'll move, I'll move the camera rather than go, don't worry, we'll do it afterwards. It's just, and I, the other thing to say is I nine times out of 10, I'm shooting off a tripod locked off. So I'll, I'll go into someone's garden, I'll set them up for a self-isolating portrait in their greenhouse, um, and I will always be on a tripod. I don't like being handheld in those situations. If I'm shooting a steel fabricator working in a foundry, I will always shoot handheld. I want to move around. I don't want to be trapped with a tri tripod. So, but nine times out of ten, I seem to be on uh, my camera would be on a tripod. That's interesting. Why do you prefer the tripod to handheld in in the scenario you mentioned then with the house portraits? Because I I think it's because I'm controlling the composition. I I go. This is my background frame. This is the environment I'm going to put these people into. I know where I'm going to put them. Uh, I'll often, I mean, last night I did uh, a mum and her two daughters and uh, I did them in their little summer house uh, at about eight o'clock yesterday evening. And I said, right, uh, I sat down in the doorway and said, right, you're going to sit here. Mum, you're going to stand here. And the other daughter, you're going to stand here. You're going to lean against the door this way. I, I suppose I'm so used to directing people in front of the camera that I will often help put them at ease by going, right, this is where you'll be, you'll be doing this, because otherwise they're a little bit like, I don't know what to do, you know. And in that situation, I have to have the camera lo locked off, because as I'm instructing them, I can see that I can see what they're going to look like in my head before I've looked at them through the camera. And I think that's born out of partly spending so much time on a plate camera, where you're looking at the whole world in reverse. But you know, as you're looking through a back of a plate camera, everything's upside down. But when you take the shot, and you show the Polaroid to your art director, it's all back around the right way, if that makes sense. So I suppose years of looking at things in, a, in an upside down world through a plate camera means that I'm so somehow quite comfortable with that. And, I'm, and I like to be locked off in that situation. Whereas if I'm in a, in a place where someone's moving around a lot and I'm trying to document them working, I need to be working. I need to be moving with them. Um, because they're often work. There are people, are, you know, in in foundries or workshops or uh, offices. If you're shooting, documenting something like that, they're moving around a lot, and you need to just let them do that, do their work, and follow them. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I like what you said then about if the shot is locked off, you can then concentrate on. You can see the shot, and then you can concentrate on directing people to fit where you want them. Essentially, that makes total sense. Total sense. Yeah. It's funny, I just, I just do it instinctively, and, and it's not until you get, I analyze it and go, actually, well, I do do that. Because I, I, you, you, know, you see so many photographers who just want the freedom to move all the time. I, I try, when I'm doing personal portraiture work, I don't want people to be hanging around in front of the camera. I, like I say, I will go in, I know the space, I will set it up, and I will often f have a C-stand with a disc on that I can focus on going, well, that disc is six foot high. That's where I'm going to have them to stand. So I can sort of check the composition where the top of their head might line up with something behind them. So it doesn't look like they've got something weird coming out of them vertically or horizontally. And you have to do that on a tripod. And then I just say, right, just come and stand here or sit here or uh, whatever I got to get them to do. And it, it always seems to work. You mentioned then about you, you're you very used to directing people. And I wanted to talk about a particular job, which was a shot you did for Samsung. 
back in, if I'm not mistaken, 2013. Is that correct? Uh, I think it's 13, 14, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the charging characters down the beach. Yes, the charging characters down the beach. Now, if anyone hasn't seen it, I urge you to check this out. It's, if I'm not mistaken, I read it's about 180 actors that make up that shot. It's a, uh, yeah, it, it, it's something like that. It was a, it was a, it was one of those dream jobs. You, you do you have? Do you want to ask me any more question wise before I answer? No, I, I guess I, I just saw it and I was fascinated by it because, just in terms of building that shot, you've got helicopters in the background with people dropping down. You've got people on horses. You've got people charging, and it just fascinated me how you built that shot. Yeah, it was what. Uh, yes, it was one of those dream jobs, and um, it came across my my desk in just before Christmas, two thousand thirteen, I think. And it was to shoot in New Zealand early in January, and it uh, it meant that I wasn't going to be. If I got the job, I wasn't going to be going to the big party we'd been planning for my wife's fiftieth. Um, and I looked at this job and went, oh, "This is so typical. I cannot believe this." You know. It's, it's often uh, I, it's often the way in in our world, though, isn't it? That we make so many sacrifices for these things. Absolutely, and my wife is a uh, she's a, a choreographer and she's a lecturer. So she's she's done a lot of work in film and television over the years, and she's incredibly understanding and, and knowledgeable about these things. So after a day of talking with my agent and the art director, I sort of was. I realized they weren't talking to anyone else to do this. So it wasn't, I wasn't going up against someone else. And they'd also told us the budget, the art buyer, very, very experienced, really, really fantastic art buyer had given us the budget, had given us all the pros and cons, as much information as she had to try and uh, help me fathom it out and, and put me at ease if I needed to be put at ease. But I was just like a kid in a sweet shop. I was like, is this really going to happen? Am I really going to go to New Zealand and we're going to shoot this on a beach over, over two weeks? So they're shooting this huge television commercial on a beach in New Zealand with that is that is easily, you know, effectively a sort of major movie shoot, really. It's a huge number. And they've given me one layout to shoot to, which is this scene of characters that we all recognise from television and film without them being specific uh, celebrities. So there are superheroes in there. There are baddies in there. There are uh, sports people in there. There are fantasy creatures in there. There are um, soldiers in there. You know, you have to look at it and you start to see all these characters. There's an astronaut floating in space slightly above them. You discover, you know, there's sort of Mad Max characters, police cops, you name it. They're in there, mafia, gangsters. I, I'm looking at it as we speak. There's there's a dinosaur as well. And there's a the dinosaur. Background. And you're, you, what you're looking at, Matthew, is them all charging towards you. Yeah? Uh, yes. And, and someone, uh, a chap, sat yep, on a, an armchair exactly. waving. Yeah, and he's waving because what he's saying, he can control his television with his hand. So he's hand up because he's, he's controlling this world of famous sort of uh, iconic fantasy TV film characters uh, because it's a it's a it's a TV screen that you can control with your hands by waving at it. So what I'm given, Matthew, is a, a a side view of what you see in a drawn layout, scribbled layout, with this huge dragon. As far as I know, I'm going to go and and try and capture as much of these characters as I can individually in bursts while they're being filmed for the TV commercial, and we're going to compositely put them together and create this final scene. As I get on the plane with uh, the very, very nice art director I'm working with, Jay, and his copywriter, Neil, I'm told, oh, there's an, can you shoot another angle, which is the angle you're looking at. So they want me not only to shoot the side view, they want me to shoot the front view. And I just looked at it and my brain just went, yeah, we can do, I can do that. It's, it's doable. Anyway, the short of it is we get to New Zealand and you've got to overcome the politics when you're shooting uh, as a stills photographer on a TV shoot. You've got to overcome the, the, the rubbing up against the director of the TV commercial, the TV producer and the client because the TV, the TV director on any commercial is sort of God really uh, and what he or she says goes. They don't want anyone to piss them off and get in their way. Um, 
And um, the director in this case, it was quite a famous director. On day one at breakfast, we had a meet and greet with him. And he couldn't have been more accommodating. It's uh, and the Ro producer... Romain Gavras, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I may have bastardised that slightly. No, that's pretty right. Yeah, check out his work. He's a, a very talented director. He couldn't have been more of a gentleman. His French uh, DOP, Director of Photography, was the man that I really needed to befriend because I knew that whatever he was filming, I had to be sitting on his shoulder because whatever was going on in front of his camera, I need to be capturing the same thing. And he just said, yeah, as long, as long as you don't get in front of my lens, Chris, you can go anywhere, you know. And I couldn't believe my luck, you know. And the the DOP, as I said, the director of photography and, uh, and Roman were just an utter delight. And they, they were just, I, you know, we got on like a house on fire. I shot on the beach for 10 days and we would start, we, we, they would start rolling cameras about 5 a.m., because we were beholden to tide times. It was a tidal beach. And usually by 4.30 in the afternoon, the beach was, the tide was fully in. Massive, massive production. And I just shot and shot and shot, having only got these two scribbled drawings of a side charge with this little man sitting in an armchair holding his hand up. And the other shot, which you can see on the website, the reverse seen from behind him looking at the characters coming towards him. Everything was shot as it happened and rolled out for TV. The only shot I had any control over was the central elfin knight on the horse. I got five minutes with him going down the beach, turning on a mark and charging towards me. And I shot, 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 shot. I ran two Canon Mark III cameras that day. Sorry, uh, that, uh, that, those, uh, for those two weeks. Uh, we shot with the live action for 10 days. Then we had the beach empty for two days just to shoot background plates for beach and sky. And then it was completely surreal. It was like, did it? We were just me and my assistant Neil were there and going, did it really happen? It's, it's all the circus has gone, you know. So that's there and back within two weeks, and it took three it took three weeks at Smoke and Mirrors in London to put them together. But whilst every night back at the hotel, Neil and I on Max would be very crudely cutting out stuff that I felt was right, and we start to put a, a rough composite together. And I remember on day four. Jay, the, the art director, was so engrossed on the TV shoot. He had no time to give me, and I didn't want to disturb him. Uh, day four, he said, if you've got anything to show me, Chris, I, the client wants to see what you've been doing. So I went, yeah, sure. So we just opened up a laptop. And I said, well, look, I'm not going to show you individual shots. We've started to put a composite together. Here's the side composite coming together, and here's the front composite together. And they, they were gobsmacked because they could see for the first time that it was going to work. And we had six more days principal photography to shoot, you know. Being in New Zealand and you wrapping up five o'clock in the afternoon and you're back in your hotel at six, you know, is pretty rare on a, on a shoot. You've got the evening to go out and eat, back up the files, get ready to get out and drive out to the location the next day really early. The weather was the big thing there because I needed the same light. They needed the same light every day. And we just sort of had a hazy softbox over us for, for 10 days. It, it was just... You know, someone was looking at really looking down on the weather gods that that shoot. And it, it was just, you know, a fantastic experience. Great shots. Check out the TV commercial if you can. Uh, if you if you just basically go onto Google and go Samsung TV ad charge, uh, you'll find it. It's an amazing bit of um, cinema photography and idea. It's a wonderful. It, you look at it and go, is this really happening? And we, you know, we were tipping cars up through the air. You name it, stuntmen. I won awards through some individual shots I did of portraits of stuntmen dressed as cowboys on horses and things. Um, yeah. And again, uh, the creative team, still friends today, uh, Jay and Neil. I've gotten uh, Jay to join me on a, a little bit of sessional lecturing at art colleges to, to tell young photography students what it's like working in the world that he inhabits. And that's, that's really special when you come away and you come back and those relationships don't just end and you go, that, that was great, you know, take care of yourself. Or, you know, I might see you around. So that's a really nice bonus that comes out of, out of the industry. 
I'm glad you mentioned about the individual portraits because I read an article from itsnicethat.com which read, and I quote, Little did we realise, however, that photographer Chris Fraser Smith, who shot the stills campaign on the same gigantic scale, had other plans for the enormous cast used. Whenever they weren't needed in front of the video cameras, Chris ensured he had cast members offset shooting their portraits against either a black backdrop or the rural seaside landscape. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that wasn't part of the initial brief. That's something that you chose to do. Am I right? Yeah, pretty much. They wanted me to shoot portraits or group scenes with the beach in the background. But that, that was it. There was, no other, there was no other description than that. And I started doing that. And I thought, well, you know, there were, while the camera was resetting and they were, they were getting the, 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 the actors and the crew onto positions down at one end of the beach because they were going to basically start running up the beach. Uh, you often had about a, well, quite often there'd be a, a 45 minute, maybe max uh, wait, waiting time. And there was always a couple of vehicles parked on the beach that were static all day. And I just said on day two, right, let's get some black drapes and let's just hang a black drape on the side of that van uh, and clip it on. And when the van on that side goes into shadow, I can shoot portraits because I like shooting people in shadow light. I don't like shooting people in direct sunlight. So we were shooting what looked like studio portraits on a beach in New Zealand in the middle of the morning and in the middle of the afternoon. And I think the agency actually used them, uh, funnily enough, for various print ads on top as well. So you, 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 you do those things partly for yourself, but part of you is also thinking, well, actually, maybe, maybe Jay, the art director, they can use this somehow in print elsewhere. So you try and give them as much as you can and more. Uh, you try and think a bit left field, and, uh, uh, but that's often born out of just the love of taking pictures. And I want to go and do this, providing you're not in any way jeopardizing the, the time that you should be spending that you, you know, on camera for them that you're being paid to do. And I will always try and what I call, it's the wrong word, but I, any shoot I can do where commercial shoot and I feel I can sort of hijack it. In other words, I can go, OK, well, we've got what you want. Can we now try this? I will do that. And quite often those are the shots they end up using and those are the shots that they didn't expect you to come back with and they're delighted because you're not just going okay i've done my job i'm going to sit around now and, and uh, chat chat you know it's like right what else can we do can we shoot that can we shoot here you know providing you're not wearing especially with people as providing you're not wearing people's energy down and go you know you don't want people in front of the camera looking knackered and, and harassed and tired it, it's it's been a constant theme with everybody that I've spoken to and Ian Gavin said his exact words were to with every job you should under promise and over deliver and it's been exactly what you've just said it's been a constant theme with everybody that I've spoken to let me ask you one more question about this commercial and then we'll move on how many images make up that final image that you see here do you know do you know what? I, I sort of do know only because if I open up the hero post-production Photoshop file. Did, did you edit the image as well? Sorry. To interrupt. I went I went in uh, and oversaw the initial post-production on it with uh, we had two we had two retouches at Smoke and Mirrors working on it full time for two uh, for three weeks. And the first I think the first eight days, it was just I, I had to select all the characters and roughly position them into a more polished retouch to get the, it was one of those working backwards things really. I almost had to show the finished thing to the art director to show to the client to get approval before we started retouching because you don't want to be two weeks into retouching and then the client go, no, I don't want, I don't want that, I don't want them. Because all the characters had to be cut out uh, and then dropped back into the shot. And as the sun moved around, even on these hazy days, there was some, there was some photography at the beginning and the end of the day where the people I'd photographed were a little bit too contrasty. So we dropped those. We had stuff that were more middle morning to mid afternoon because the light was a little more toppy. Although the sun was always biased to a certain side, it was biased, I think, on the charge shot looking, as you're looking at that, I think the, the highlights are on the left of the frame a little bit more. So you have to really bear that in mind. So I did a, a pretty, you know, crudely cut out, but quite polished, a composite of where I thought everybody should be and there was a de huge degree of flexibility and the client approved that we started cutting everything out properly and I just left them to do that for eight nine days 
then they started to put everything together. And we worked from, you realize that you work from the front and go out sideways because you want to create that that feeling of the people who are on the left and the right are further back in the frame, so they're smaller. And then you realize you've got a wall of people, so how do you get everybody else in? So you have to very carefully recompose all the other characters in there. And as I say to everybody, the only thing, I think if this is true, the only thing that isn't real is the T-Rex. I think the T-Rex is CGI. I don't think we found a real T-Rex. And people look at you and go, it's not a real T-Rex, and you go, no, of course it's not a real T-Rex, you know. But for a moment, they go, they, their brain's going, oh, it's a real dinosaur, you know. <laughs> but the two helicopters, for example, are not the same helicopter stripped in twice. They were, they were rolling film with two helicopters. Those guys dressed in their SWAT outfits are dropping out of the helicopters. As, as I shot, they were dropping into the sea, stuntmen coming down the ropes. It was amazing. So there's very little... Step, I don't think actually there's any step, what we call step and repeat, taking the same thing, shot from another angle and put in again. They're all unique, one-off pieces. Some of the clusters in there are little groups. We've managed to get three, you know, uh, out of three Roman soldiers or something. I can't remember. The Minotaur on the chariot running up and down on, on uh, is he up to the left? I can't remember. I haven't got it in front of me. Yeah, so I would then, you know, go into Smoke and Mirrors every other day because it took them quite a long time to then start building everything back in. And I think the last four days, I sat in there all day with both retouchers. And just purely out of coincidence, the TV was being edited in the same street, which is Poland Street, on the edge of Soho. So Jay was, was popping out of the, the, the film editing, or it might have been sound editing. I think it was sound editing. He was popping out literally four buildings down from Smoke and Mirrors and running back in you know, every couple of hours to see where we are. And we, we were getting incredibly excited at the end. And the, the extraordinary thing is we had we had these two viewpoints. We had the side view, which you, I don't think you can see there, Matthew, on my site, uh, which was the original concept, but we always preferred this front front view. I can remember being on the peripherique about four months later, driving around Paris, and it was on a super site. And fortunately, I wasn't driving, because, you know, it, you still get incredibly excited when you see your image, your commissioned image on a billboard, or you open a supplement or a magazine, and there it is. You, you, there's still this incredible buzz of excitement when you see your image in print, you know, out there in the real world. It's an incredible shot, and if you're listening, I urge you to check it out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Let's move on to awards, if I may, because if you were a Boy Scout and you had a sleeve, you would have all the badges. You have an incredible collection of awards. To name a few, the British Photography Awards Portrait Prize 2020, which was for another commercial you did in New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken, and it's for gentlemen on horses, which we'll come to in a second. The National Portrait Gallery Only Human Awards, American Photography Awards. There's a lot. There's an awful lot, and it's testament to your work. Is there one that stands out amongst the others? For you personally, uh, this is the one you're most proud of, I guess, is what I'm I asking. think it's the Lucy Photographer of the Year, the first International Photographer of the Year awards, and I, I was quite shocked when I got it. It was the first year they'd run the awards, and the IPA has become a massive thing since. I'd entered work into multiple categories, just thinking, you know, it's, it sounds quite exciting this award. Let's give it a go, and I won Photographer of the Year, and that was a big, that was a surprise, <laughs> and. I was funny enough in New York shooting uh, the week of the awards, which were, were being held at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles. And our son, Ben, was about eight months old. And I just said to Jane, my wife, this isn't going to happen again. The two of you, let's get you out to L.A. and come out. So th they flew out on a Friday and then flew back on a Monday. <laughs> uh, so that was it. That was very special. And. There was some great, I mean, Steve McCurry was there, who, whose work I absolutely adore, the colour the color documentary photographer. So I, got, had a, I had an opportunity to meet Steve McCurry and have breakfast with him after the awards. I think he was given a, uh, he was either given a lifetime award or he was given a, another award uh, that was a big thing for him. And the other thing is that uh, I'm a big Star Trek fan and um, Leonard Nimoy was there giving out an award, not my award. I got to sort of almost say live long and prosper to, to Leonard Nimoy backstage afterwards and meet him. So that was, I think that was very special. I think, you know, winning any award is, 
is a nice uh, pat on the back. You have to be careful these days. There are so many awards to enter. You, you have to really truthfully see it just as, you know, this is just a, a means of uh, marketing myself and then going out and saying to people, oh, I've just got something in the British Portrait Awards this year or whatever, Photography Awards. And it, you see it as an excuse to remind people that basically you're still alive and out there working, you know. And I think you, you can spend a lot of money as well entering awards. And I, I think that it's it's something that is budget driven. You can't be egotistic about it and sort of go around, oh, yeah, I've won another award. How fantastic. You know, I'm so good. It is really driven out of out of marketing. And that's something I learned as a student where we as an art college, we won what was then the, the, the student Polaroid competition. And it drew a lot of attention from other uh, photography manufacturers, Kodak being one. And he realized the power that awards could have in terms of drawing attention to what you do and people taking notice of what you do. So you just, I see it as that really. Uh, and I enter less these days because I don't feel, it's, I don't do it because I feel I've got to prove something. I've got something in this year's association, the AOP awards and the por portrait, uh, portrait finalist for Funnily enough, for a portrait I, I shot here in the village of a local hairdresser who's run a, her hairdressing shop for the last 40 years. And the shop doesn't look like it's changed for 40 years. So, you know, it's nice when things like that happen, really. I think it's it's much nicer with, with personal work because it kind of says, you know, keep, keep persevering at your personal work. Other people like it. You know, keep chiseling away at that cold face, so to speak. Well, I guess that was where I was heading with this conversation was that do you feel that it's been that these awards have been helpful in terms of progressing your career because if you're a client for example and you look at someone and they've won a Lucy award there's an automatically there's an element of trust before you've even met them seen their work you know they can deliver I hope so yeah I don't I don't do you know I don't really know at the end of the day I don't know how many people actually uh, look at the awards one there was a long period of time where I didn't show any award listings on my website and when I revamped the website two years ago I thought well let's have them back because there's a sort of nice chronological thing to it and for the you know I think it's it's art directors that do notice it will occasionally talk to me about it on shoots and go oh I saw you won some blah blah blahs you know what was that like and I, I, it, it's I guess it's there because, you know, if you won all these awards, then why not have them there? It's, it, does, it does reinforce, as you just sort of said, I think, Matthew, it does reinforce some sort of degree of professionalism and you being kind of at the top of your game, I suppose, really. Well, I mean, your, your image for the British Photography Awards Portrait Prize 2020 is the reason that we're speaking now, because I was searching around the web and looking for people that I'd like to speak to and I I purposely didn't look at what they'd won I just looked and found a shot that I liked and that one just caught my eye immediately and again I'll put a link to it in the show notes for anyone listening it is four gentlemen on a horse on a beach in New Zealand uh, on a horse that would be strange they're on a horse <laughs> each can you talk us through that shot well um, that was shot that was shot on the Samsung job and it it resided on a hard drive and I Sorry, on the, on the same Samsung job yeah. we were talking about? Oh, yeah, I see, right. And I, it resided on a hard drive till I think last year, and I sort of looked at it and thought, well, hang on a minute, this is a cracking picture. So I entered that, I, I got shortlisted for five awards that night, and you don't know what you're going to win. And they were fully aware that this wasn't something I shot last year or the year before. And the other portraits were beautiful. And, you know, it was, at the, you know, that awards is in its second year. It's at the Savoy. Every award category is designed to raise money for individual charities. And it's a little bit left field of thinking out of, the, of perhaps a lot of mainstream awards. So that's a really good thing. It, it nominates, uh, you, you nominate charities. They've got charities for each category. Uh, oh, no, they've got charity. They've got a selection of, of charities. You not, you submit your picture and you go well i want you know if it gets in i want the money that i'm paying for to go in to go to this charity so it's got everything from big ones like help for heroes down to charities you've never heard of doing great things and um i thought that was really refreshing so it's a big black tie do at the savoy which is quite rare these days in in photography awards it's usually us looking like a scruffy bunch swigging beer from a bottle whilst we're trying to hear what the bloke is saying on the microphone as he as he announces the next category so it was really really well run great atmosphere and honestly as the portraits went up i went 
oh, that will win, that will win. So when I won, I was, I was, I mean, I mean this genuinely, I was really quite surprised and or delighted as well, you know. And if I'm not mistaken, the, the four gentlemen in the shot, they're not actually in a scene at this point. They're, they're resting before coming on set. They are four stuntmen on a horse. We were working, as I say, with this huge crew, but these cowboys in particular were, these stuntmen dressed as cowboys were so, I've never, I mean, I've worked with, uh, I've been in bullfighting rings with bulls and horse, you know, matadors on horses, but watching these stuntmen ride the horses the way they rode them, rode them was uh, quite remarkable. And we, we became offset. We became really, uh, we spent a lot of time in the catering tents at lunch talking but every time I was there with a camera in front of them, they, were, they would never stay. They only would stay in character. They were hard staring sheriffs, you know, who rode into town looking for the bad guys to cart them off. And they're just waiting to be called back onto set and they're resting the horses in the edge of the water. And I, I can remember taking that picture and going, oh my God, that's a stunning picture. The agency couldn't use it for anything. And I think that's why it resided on a hard drive and I didn't really revisit it again until last year. Yeah, so there you go. It's, it's, it's an incredible shot, and again, I will link to it in the show notes so people can, can check it out. Your, your work is for sale in the Crane Kalman Gallery in Brighton. This is something that a lot of photographers, including myself, I would love to have my work sold because I think there's a lovely... If you're shooting for a campaign and for a client, you then deliver that work and it's for a reason, it's to sell a product. Whereas if your work is in a gallery and someone walks in and looks at it and goes, I want that on my wall, that is a lovely recognition of your work because they are buying it because they purely love it and they love your work. How did you end up with your work in that gallery in the first place? I've, you know, I've slightly forgotten how Richard, who run, whose gallery it is, contacted me. I, he'd seen a picture in the same way perhaps that you'd seen the Cowboys. So he got hold of me and said, I've seen this picture, is it yours? And I said, yes. He said, have you got any others in that series? And I'd, I'd, I'd been shooting urban landscapes in Hong Kong about 10 years ago. I'd, I'd been there six months before shooting for HSBC uh, and didn't have any time to hijack the shoot and go off and shoot personal work. And it needed, it needed some research and, and location scouting to find certain locations that I had in my head so he saw that I showed him the others and he said would you you know do you want me to try and sell them through the gallery I said yeah why not so that's how that relationship developed and uh it's a it's a very nice thing to do and I I, I genuinely wish I had more time to immerse myself in shooting work that I knew Richard could uh, successfully sell Be because you've got, you've got to keep feeding a gallery new work and new projects. The work that Richard has is predominantly very personal urban landscape work that I've shot. I've shot gazillions of landscapes in my time out of the pure pleasure of, of uh, landscape photography. And I would go off as an assistant for, for two weeks at a time to the west coast of Scotland, to the west coast of Ireland, and take my two weeks holiday as an assistant and shoot from dawn till dusk with Linhoff 16, 7, 617 Technoramic cameras uh, and my 5.4 camera and the occasional portrait on one of my Mimirs. I've got a massive library of personal landscape work that I've, I don't really do anything with. I, I, the urban colour landscape work that I've shot, it, it's definitely, there's a lot of it out there with other photographers. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that I haven't pursued it. It's trying to find another angle on it, really. It's it's lovely to do. You don't make a lot of money from it. So to make a living from it is even harder. Uh, a gallery will take 50% of any sale predominantly. You will share the, the mounting or the framing costs. And I tend to show the work. The, the work tends to be a minimum of a meter and a half wide by about a meter deep. So it's very, very big prints on, on aluminium sheets that have got what are called subframes on the back. It's expensive to frame. But it's done very well, and we've limited it all to editions of 25, and a lot of those editions are close to selling out now. And it is lovely to go into a gallery and see your work. And I keep getting asked the thing about ex ex exhibiting. And people go, well, why don't you do more exhibiting? And I go, well, you've got to have a body of work that has a cohesive, completely three-dimensional structure to it in terms of the narrative and the reason why you're putting these pictures on a wall in a gallery. You know, so for the, 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 I can't just go in and put pretty pictures on a wall and go, um, 
aren't they lovely? Would you like to buy them? It's got to be a little bit more, it's got to go a bit deeper than that, I think. And maybe there's something that will happen with the portraiture as it evolves uh, over the years, because, uh, you know, I've had a couple of things hang in the National Portrait Gallery, and that is the most exciting thing you can have. I personally feel to see your work hanging in the National Portrait Gallery is, uh, you, you kind of feel you've done all right, you know. I uh, did something right to, to get to get to this stage. I, I think more than all right. So you have two images in the in the national. There was a, yeah, the, yeah. There was a, a funny competition uh, that Martin Parr set up last year, and I, I think you could submit three images, and you did it through Instagram. And you hashtag hashtagged it. Uh, I suddenly got an email from uh, I noticed an email from a name who works with photography in the National Gallery. A National Portrait Gallery that I'd seen before when I've had uh, had work in with um, Taylor Wessing before, and I went, "Oh, why have I got an email from her?" And it's like, "Well, congratulations, your picture of Pat and Arthur has been chosen by Martin to hang in the the We Are Only Human exhibition." So, so that was a, that was a nice surprise. And they're running a really another an, uh, they're running an, a self isolating competition at the moment that's open to anyone and everyone. Uh, if you go onto the National Portraits website, not necessarily their Instagram feed. Uh, I think it's hashtag hold still 2020 is the hashtag. But yeah, that's 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 nice to see your work in a in a public proper public gallery. And I feel that in the last 10 years, say left at least 10 years ago, I made a very conscious effort to say to anyone looking at my work, you're only going to see pictures of people, whether they're people as a mass crowd running up a beach dressed as these characters, or they're tight headshot portraits shot in a more studio environment or environmental environment. That's all you're going to see. That's all I want to do, Matthew. I don't want to shoot landscapes anymore. I don't want to shoot car campaigns anymore, unless they're very strongly driven by people in the picture. People has got to be the first reason rather than another subject matter. I'm happy to go and do those things for pleasure, landscapes in particular, uh, and do documentary stories in particular for myself and shoot more, try and shoot more motion film as well. But I've got a very long-winded way about talking about galleries, haven't I? That's totally fine. It's totally fine. I could listen to you all day. What's the, what's the best mistake you've made as a photographer? I always say to students, mistakes are a good thing because you, you know, you you learn from them. And if you don't learn from your stakes, you will not advance forward. You will not move forward. So I quite like it. I quite like it when I see people making mistakes, because as long as they're not being detrimental to themselves, physically, mentally to others, they hopefully will learn from them, whether it's photography or, or DIY or turning left, whatever it is. Have What mistakes have I made? I think probably in the very early few years, I try to be a jack of all trades, master of none, probably. So I was showing landscapes, portraits, uh, and still life. And just for the first few years, really. And then, then, as I said, the French thing took off, the black and white thing took off, that was predominantly people based. And then there's been moments where it's moved a little bit to automotive, people will, will commission me to shoot a lot of car stuff. Prior to that, because of the French connection, I was shooting more and more beauty work, funnily enough, in the studio. And I didn't like going down that road. And I sort of learned from the jack of all trades, master of none. No, no, you're, you, you do need, whether you like it or not, there's very few photographers in the sort of Irving Penn style who can shoot still life, beauty, fashion, uh, portraits, and, and, and be so successful at it. Uh, so I think that was probably a little bit of a mistake, but that was a long time ago. On set, have I ever made mistakes? Um, nothing springs to mind. That's good. In fact, I, I enjoyed the um, Jack of All Trades and Master of None, actually. I think it's very important and I think often gets overlooked. Do you have a photography motto that you work by? And by that, I mean, so I, I always like to think, capturing small moments that make a big difference it's cheesy but i quite like it because you can see the smallest tiniest detail in someone's life and if you if you capture it it's there forever and if you miss it it's gone forever well i have a rude one i I can say it to you because you can always edit it out but my my sort of mantra and it might not be quite what you're looking for is uh, assumption is the mother of fuck-ups never assume anything because if you assume everything or anything you'll get caught out. And that is something that uh, Gerard Mankovich told me when I started assisting him. So it's not something that I've come up with, but he told me that 
And I sort of pass that on a little bit. So that's one thing that's, that always springs to mind when people ask me a, a question along, along that line. The devil in the detail, really. I, I'm always saying to art directors, when we're looking at the screen and looking at a capture and an art director will go, can we just move that there? And can we also, uh, where's the stylist? Can we just add that prop into that part of the shot? And I know, I just know in my head whether he's right or she's wrong. Um, and I will say to him or her as the art director, uh, let's see what it looks like. If it adds anything, let's keep it. If it's if the picture stays the same and it doesn't add anything, let's take it back out because it's just another thing in there that doesn't add anything to the shot. It just makes it stay the same. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, that's one thing that I, I've often, and even when I'm shooting my personal work, I'll look at the shot, I'll look at the frame. So last night when I'm shooting this portrait of a mother and two daughters, there are two quite scruffy little pot plants outside this little wooden summer house. The mum says to me, oh, I'll just move these. I go, no, 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 leave them. They are, that's, they exist for a reason. Don't take them away. Because if you take them away, I know that actually they're adding to the narrative of your gardening skills because you're quite happy with your pots. They're not flashy. They're not ostentatious. They are just, you know, these little pots with something in them that, that you know, is just there. But keep them. Yes, because they, as you say, they tell the story because that's, they help. that's real life. Yeah. They help exactly. And I don't, like, I don't like art directing personal work by turning up, composing the shot and then start to move the metaphorical room around. I don't like moving things around. It, it's, I moved a black coat off a chair last night because it created a black space behind what was quite dark wardrobe and I couldn't see the wooden background of the, this little summer house. So I felt that that was a reasonably fair thing to do. Otherwise, it was something that drew my eye to a dark space on the shot. And I always think that with a great photograph, you should be able to look at anything in that picture, the top left corner, the bottom middle, the middle, the right hand side, and enjoy every aspect of that image. There's, there's not necessarily one thing that ultimately drags your eye immediately because if something's dragging your eye all the time it can often be a bit annoying and distract yes of course you want it to act i know what you're saying you want it to add to the picture rather than distract a black coat for example pulls your exactly. attention in the wrong it can do direction yes. yes what is the most important item in your kit bag oh god Apart from um, apart, apart from, from the equipment. obvious, obviously. Apart from the obvious. Oh, just, well, is that you know? Is is there something? And it can be something tiny. Is there just something that you always have with you that you rely on and that you you take everywhere with you? you wow! Yes. If I'm there's not, to it's totally fine. Well, if there's not, because it can be a combination of many things. Well, spiritually, it's always the word anticipation. I'm always anticipating everything. So, in terms of my equipment, sort of spiritually, it's anticipation. And that can be anticipating the weather. It can be anticipating, you know, uh, something not hasn't been wrecked properly. And I'm worried that when I get there, it's not going to be what I think it is. But in terms of equipment, what do I always take with me that I would miss hugely? I think it's probably, this is a bit strange or maybe not, it's probably the 80, my 85 millimeter Canon Prime lens. Because... I have moved a little bit away from wanting to shoot on zoom lenses, much more back to primes and moving the camera on the tripod to accommodate the composition rather than zooming in or out. And I think that I, I'm always absolutely blown away by what that lens does at shallow depth of field and how sharp it is, uh, especially how sharp it is on the edge of frame where often lenses are the weakest on the edge of the glass. I often now find myself taking the Canon kit when I know I'm going to shoot on my phase kit, but I've sort of, uh, you know, over my shoulder, I can feel that lens sort of looking at me saying, get me out, get me out, have a go with me rather than shooting on your phase, you know. So I think that that, that, that Canon lens is becoming a close friend. I like that. I like that a lot. And I love your answer about more spiritual rather than equipment based, because ultimately without that, it's like Ian Gavin said to me, uh, the most important thing always for him is his attitude because without yeah. that yeah you could have the best camera in the world how can i describe this no uh, i know exactly what you know mean. what i'm saying without without the right attitude you'll never capture the shot you're looking for absolutely. so i like that yeah yeah absolutely and you have to you have to that the attitude you have to have with especially when you're shooting with people and crews is that you have to you have to tread a fine path when you think that someone in the crew 
might be, you know, a bit of an ass and a bit distracted by their own personality rather than concentrating on what they should be doing. And you've got to have the right attitude to control that situation and uh, and make sure that they are focusing on whatever the job is they should be focusing on. Uh, so yeah, that's attitudes are going. I think you, you know, photographers' eyes are probably the most important thing because it's the way you see the world that you're taking into a situation. I always see the shot with my eyes before I put the camera up. I know what I'm. I, I can. That's the shot. Have a look through the camera. Yup, that's the shot. Ca- camera locked off. Tripod. Shoot. You know. There was a time when uh, there's been less traveling in the last couple of years, flying wise. But there was a time where. And I'm not really a religious person in in the true sense of the word. But if I wasn't wearing a St. Christopher's my wife had given me, I would feel much more nervous flying. (laughs) And, you know, like everyone, you you hit um, turbulence in an aircraft at 35,000 feet. And we all, some of us, some people are as cool as cucumbers. But I sort of sit there and after 10 minutes of shaking with a seatbelt light and I'm going, please stop, please stop, you know. And I'm always, I slightly pat my upper chest and go, yep, I got my, I got the patent saint of travelers with me. And we also have the same name, Christopher. So, but that's, you know, that's a bit of a silly one, maybe. No, it, it's not silly at all. It's not silly at all. What is, I've asked this a few times and I'm not entirely sure it's the right question. I was going to say, what is the ultimate goal? But I think it could be maybe better phrased as once you have put the camera down, how would you like you and your work to be remembered? There may be two different questions. Maybe you've got an answer for both. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a hard one. Um, First of all, it's the idea that as a self-motivated creative person, you you sort of go, uh, when am I going to give myself the carriage clock and put it on the mantelpiece? You know, I, I can't, I can't ever envisage that. And my, my wife's much better at envisaging her retirement for some reason as a choreographer. She, she, she's taught for many years. So she's looking forward to sort of, I think what she means, she's looking forward to her teacher's pension and then going off and doing other things with it, I hope. I, selfishly, I would like to be remembered ultimately by my children for taking lots of pictures of them when they were little and uh, documenting them a lot. So when they're older and hopefully got their own kids or whatever, they can go back through the family albums and go, God, aren't we lucky we had dad? Dad was a photographer. Look what he shot, you know. That would be one uh, legacy I'd like to leave behind. And I'm sure that will happen anyway. I sometimes worry that a, a lot of it, like so many of us, just res- all those pictures reside on hard drives rather than in prints, in albums, as, as we, we should have them. But I'm working on that uh, slowly but surely, getting them printed. Funnily enough, some of the, the shots that I've done commercially that will have longevity pictures like I shot the cover for uh, Ian McEwan's Atonement and that's been a a picture that people love and sort of has because it's a slightly costume styled um, historical piece uh, wardrobe wise it's black and white it's sort of timeless in a way I think that picture will always have a degree of legacy it's difficult isn't it it's difficult i mean when we're gone we have no idea i mean it's a sort of it's funny the old going through all the analog film now is a huge trip down memory lane as i'm slowly pulling out images and going and i remember exactly where i was when i see any contact sheet i know exactly where i was and who was with me it's funny it's like it's that's but i could never remember my four times table or tell me the order of kings since king henry the eighth but i can i can go back into two decades of film, and I know exactly where we were, what year it was, who my assistant was. It's it's really weird, but that's that's just my left left visual brain, I think. No, I, I don't think it's weird at all, and it's something that Philip Lee Harvey and I discussed because same as you, I can look at an image and I I know instantly as soon as I see it where I was, what the weather was like, who I was with. I don't know why there's a clarity almost when you look at an image, which is again one of the things that. I love about photography. Yes. I suppose I mentioned the analog thing because there's a tactile, you, you can instantly pick the, the, the contact sheets up or the transparencies and look at them on a light box. Whereas all the images that we've shot digitally, if we're past, you know, I've got a hard drive here called Family. The first pictures on there will be the first years I met my wife and I've got pictures of when the kids were born in hospital. You know, th- they're my memories on that hard drive. Whether the kids are interested in them or not is one thing, but whether they're going to have the, whether they can be bothered over the years in, to come many years from now to boot the hard drive up and actually start going through it, I don't know. So that's why I'm printing those all out for them, for that memory. So they give, that, that gives me a lot of pleasure, that looking at those pictures. 
Ob- uh, obviously, because um, it's your family. Yeah. Of course, of course. I'm sure they will. All right, I'm going to ask you a few quick fire questions and I'm going to try where possible to hold you to an answer. So, black and white or colour? Colour. Uh, colour, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm so afraid. Like, I mean, black and white. Yeah, I mean, lot, uh, most, a lot of photographers are going to really struggle with that because. Like I say, there was this period, golden period for me shooting just black and white. You know, the sm- I don't miss the carcinogenic fumes of the darkroom anymore. Yeah, it's colour. I mean, there's very little black and white work in my portfolio now. Is studio light or natural light? God's light every time. <laughs> I mean, I've, I, I, can, I can light anything and I've got years of lighting experience, but... Just shooting, for example, the self-isolating portraits. I've shot some in quite difficult conditions, very low light, right at the end of the day. I'm outside, they're inside, the reflections are all over the glass. And if I had a little flash popping off inside on the person I'm portraying the other side of the glass, it would uh, it would get rid of so many uh, issues. But I've said no, just go with God's light, as I call it. I did wonder, actually, and it was one of my questions, and we just didn't get round to it, whether they were all natural light or you'd used... A flash on some of them because as you say you can see that the light is challenging in some of them particularly or, or would have been challenging there's one where they're i think they're in a barn and there's four people on uh, yep. square windows yep. and i looked yep. at it and thought that's hard to shoot it's presumably yeah. dark in there well it's actually quite light in there you just got to you've just got to wait for the ambient light level to drop sufficiently that your exposure values are taking away a lot of the highlights and you're just dealing with darker backgrounds providing this, there's no sun on the whatever the windows are reflecting providing it's reflecting everything in in the shadow and the sun's dropped off it it's going pretty dark and i'm not even i'm not i tried one with a polarizer and it didn't make any difference so it's like well a polarizer is taking one and a half stops off my aperture and i'm on sh- i'm on slow shutter speeds as it is because the light levels are so low by 8 15 nine, half 8 at night so no it's just me and a canon 5ds uh, oh which perfectly is my next question canon or nikon or other canon i, I mean i i shoot I shoot tons on my face cameras, but the Canon now, the 5DS, it's just, an, a, a, you know, the file size off that with the right lens, it's an awesome bit of uh, equipment at, at that price. Excellent. I think I know the answer to this next one, commercial project or personal project? The latter, personal. Of course. Uh, Prime or Zoom? Tricky, but, I, you know, as I touched upon the, the, the Prime a little bit with the 85 earlier, um, Prime. Film or digital? This is well. This is this is timely because of scanning everything again. Actually, scanning five four film and looking at how soft things are, even though the camera's the focus is sharp, I'm just going hallelujah analog. Uh, sorry, hallelujah digital. You know, I love the years in the dark room. There is something incredibly special about a print off a negative or a transparency. There's no question about it. Uh, it it's always got a quality that you can never match with uh, post-production software, filters. It's just different, but I'd have to say digital. Home or abroad? And I mean in, in a pure work environment, if you take family out of the equation, home or abroad? I think at home because I found, as I was saying earlier, right on my doorstep, I'm finding poor, I'm finding great subjects to photograph. Two miles from here, I, I spent 18 months uh, documenting on film a very eminent British sculptor and making a 12-minute documentary about him. So it was finding things on your, that's, your doorstep. That's, that's John Mills, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Yeah. 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 And actually, I can't show the whole film in its entirety. It's still it's still going in and out of film competitions and um, film festivals. And you have to sort of have it off the public domain for those things. It'll it'll if anyone wants to see it, they can email me and I'll send them a link to the full Vimeo 12 minute version. But, yeah, I'd say I think home, Matthew, I think that it's it's easy to find the exotic abroad uh, more inspiring. I think it's more challenging and pushes the comfort zones more. And it's more rewarding for me personally to find things more more homebound. And finally, again, I think I know the answer to this, but people or landscapes? I think people. I think, yeah, definitely people. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, landscape photography, I adore. It's a fantastic thing to do. But working with people in front of the camera is is very special. What a lovely way to end our conversation. Chris Fraser-Smith, you have been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for your time. Well, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure, and um, you know, uh, thank you for for inviting me. I, you know, I've I've enjoyed the ones I've heard thus far, and I'm I'm very excited that you're going to be doing this with many other photographers and hearing hearing about them and their lives. That was my conversation with the wonderful Chris Fraser Smith. A huge, huge thank you to Chris for coming on the show, and I hope you all enjoyed listening to him as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. If you'd like to find out more about Chris, you can find him on Instagram at Chris Fraser Smith or visit his website www.chrisfrasersmith.com and that is Fraser with a Z. If you enjoy the Stand Up Photography Show, subscribe and download future episodes on all the usual channels. And if you can find time to leave us a review, we would absolutely love to hear what you think of the show and more importantly, what you'd like to hear more of in future episodes. This show all about you it's all about making you a better photographer so if there's something you want to hear please let me know and if you do leave a review please be sure to include your instagram or twitter handle so that i can thank you personally like owens682 who said five stars really enjoyed this i've been photographing as a hobby for many years and just taken the plunge into starting a business congratulations owens682 Thoroughly enjoyed listening to how the pros work. Already subscribed. Can't wait to hear more. Owens682, you are wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And if there's something that sparked your interest during my conversation with Chris, you can find links from the episode and show notes over at thestandoutcompany.com forward slash podcast. That is thestandoutcompany.com forward slash podcast podcast where you can also sign up to our weekly newsletter would you enjoy maximizing your photography work and your photography lifestyle in one short email it lands in your inbox every friday where i'll share with you things that i've discovered from speaking to photographers throughout the week it could be software recommendations articles books videos we've shared it is a very short sharp shot of goodness that could make a big difference to your photography so if you want to receive that head on over to the standoutcompany.com forward slash podcast drop in your email and you'll receive one every single friday for now Thank you very much for joining me. As always, I've been Matthew Walker. He has been Chris Fraser-Smith. And you, you have been sensational. Until next time.